Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our final brain club of the 2022 season. Brain club season one. I can never, like maybe in 2023, I'm going to figure out how to not obstruct my own screen with Zoom. Okay, cool. Great. All right. So to cap off our Brain Club 22 Greatest Hits, we'll be revisiting one of our favorite things to talk about, access needs. And by the way, because I think there's at least one person I haven't met yet. Hi, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong. So um, bef uh, if this is your first Brain Club, or even if it's not, um, we always begin with our introductions and community agreements. So all forms of participation are okay, meaning you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. You can move, stim, eat, fidget, have anyone or anything climbing all over you. And you can communicate however you'd like to as far as whether you're unmuting, typing in the chat box, any of the above. Um, and uh, because safety is really important to us here, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, it's really important that we uh, create a safe space. And to that end, um, a few weeks ago, our community advisory board created a new community agreement. Um, Brain Club is a community education program. This is not a medical or therapeutic support group. So this is general education about neurodiversity related topics. And we do not have capacity to provide medical advice or therapy. So individual traumatic experiences are best processed with a trained therapist, not at Brain Club. And in order to create space and time and an environment for people of all ages to participate, um, we just ask that you use discretion in terms of the language that you're using communicating here at Brain Club. Okay, last bit of access needs to turn on closed captioning. It is already enabled. All you gotta do is toggle it on if you'd like to use it, depending on your version of Zoom, either the live transcript closed captioning button, or if you don't see that one, more dot, 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 and choose show subtitles or high subtitles if you'd like to turn them off. All right. La a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, this Saturday is our virtual New Year's Eve party, Saturday 5 to 7.30 Eastern. We've got a variety of activities uh, for all ages, including a special edition brain club, unlearning the brain rules of New Year's, becoming your authentic self. Um, Amanda Diekman will be returning and will be uh, presenting on that topic. We pre-recorded it, so I can already tell you it's 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 a it's a pretty awesome conversation that I look forward to sharing with you. Um, and then after that, we've got some Zoom breakout rooms with a variety of activities, and then finally a concert, a musical performance by the Misty Bay Ramblers. Um, they're a trio that will be playing um, uh, rock and roll, alt rock, folk covers in addition to originals. So I, I hope you can can join us. Oh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for posting the registration link. Uh, so it is it is free. We'd love everyone to attend. Um, it is also the last day of our reimagining what's possible campaign. Um, and so look how close we are. That's amazing. So we've got four and four days and change. So um, uh, and if you're not already on the All Brains Belong newsletter, um, oh, thanks, Sarah, for posting that. If you're, um, it, we'll have a, 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 a newsletter going out on Thursday um, uh, with, with, with an update on community impact and the campaign. And if anyone is able to forward that on to the people in your lives um, who might consider um, supporting uh, the work of trying to make life better for the neurodivergent community. We would so appreciate it uh, because all of our community programs, Brain Club and otherwise, are all offered um, at, at no cost to participants, and we'd love to be able to continue to do that. Lastly, uh, speaking of community programs, um, one of our volunteers um, uh, was uh, two of our volunteers um, uh, worked really hard um, at, uh, at at putting together this directory that's now available on the Brain Club site, allbrainsbelong.org forward slash brain dash club. It is a clickable directory with hyperlinks to all of the Brain Clubs uh, for 12 months. 
So yeah, so this way you don't have to go through and like pick out the topics and register and get all these emails. So many thanks to Greg Costin um, and Lizzie Perrett for putting all of this together. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and there we go. And we will begin with our topic, um, communicating our access needs. Um, and Jen, if you can share screen and start the video, that would be awesome. All right, sit tight. Um, based on feedback that um, some of the streaming lag, oh, there we go, perfect. So, so Orca Media, in addition to producing all of our Brain Club recordings, um, has made a huge, uh, hopefully for those of you who, uh, who participated in Brain Club last week, um, I, I, it, it seemed like really much improved um, when, when, uh, when, you, when you take some technological challenge off my hands, it's always done better um, by anything Orca Media does a million times, gazillion times better than I could ever pull off. So thank you, Jin. Um, if you can hit play, then we'll be good to go. All right, so for, for a few months now, we have been talking about how, unfortunately, despite there being no default brain, there are a lot of defaults in our society, right? Like defaults of like, oh, this is how healthcare is delivered. This is what it means to like be an adult. This is what it means to be a worker. This is what it means to be a student anyway. And that's not true because in fact, we all have different brains that do things differently. And what we don't want is we don't want to be in a situation where we are hammering to try to get that square peg to fit into the round hole. And like, what happens? You destroy the peg. And that is what happens to so many people. So how this connects to access needs are that we all have access needs. Access needs are anything that is required to meaningfully participate in one's environment or community. And as I said, we all have them. This might be physical access needs, emotional, communication, you know, like so all different types of access needs. And so often we get the message that if we have needs, we are in some way needy and um, explicitly or implicitly, sometimes often people get the message that we shouldn't have needs, that it's selfish to have needs. Like that's not a thing, that's a myth. And um, that is um, really hard because when we think about full participation in our world and our lives, the social model of disability is about the barriers in the environment between the person and full participation. And it's not about there being something wrong with the individual, it's about those barriers being in place. And so we want to have as few barriers to full participation as possible. And when we think about um, how, this, how this plays out in interpersonal relationships, I'm gonna play a little, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna uh, throw in a little excerpt from a brain club we did in January called Everyone Flips Their Leg, um, where, you know, there's things that, that make us stress that are going to differ person to person and like context specific. Like if there's something in the physical environment, like a loud sound, if I'm like well hydrated and well rested, I might not be as stressed as if I'm, you know, haven't done those things or have like a huge cognitive load or whatever, like with this business of the zoom and the link and the whatever and all the switching between things. If, if a motorcycle drives by my house right now, I'm gonna flip my lid. Whereas like I might've been okay a couple hours ago. So um, when we get triggered, when and borrowing from a, um, 
a model from Dr. Dan Siegel, Dr. Tina Green Bryson uh, from the whole brain child, upstairs brain and downstairs brain, when downstairs brain gets triggered, we don't get to pick what triggers us. And sometimes we forget that there that we have interpersonal access needs. It's not just about sensory processing or like how we learn. It's 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 about access needs in a relationship. What does it mean for downstairs brain to feel safe? And so um, when we think about, since we all have access needs, often those access needs conflict with other people. And I might play this clip. I might just come back to it. Well, maybe. It depends on if I can just unshare and reshare. There you go. I got to share the sound or it's not going to work. Mm. Oh, we can invite all 12 of your brothers what? to stay no. with us. No, 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 no. Of course we have the room. Just I don't wait. know some of them. Wait, slow must... down. No one's brothers are staying here. No one is getting married. Wait, what? May I talk to you, please? Alone? No. Whatever you have to say, you, you can say to both of us. Fine. You can't marry a man you just met. You can if it's true love. Anna, what do you know about true love? Well, more than you, all you know is how to shut people out. You asked for my blessing, but my answer is no. Now, excuse me. Your Majesty, if I may ease no, your- No, you may not, and I, I think you should go. The party is over, close the gates. Yes, Your Majesty. Elsa, no, no, wait, give me my glove. Elsa, please, please, I can't live like this anymore. Then leave. What did I ever do to you? Enough, Anna. No, why? Why do you shut me out? Why, why do you shut the world out? What are you so afraid of? I said enough! So, um, here we have a relationship with two people with access needs. One is looking to assert them by taking space. One has foot on the gas with an access need to communicate right here now. Boom, that didn't work out so well. I'm curious, anybody else ever experienced conflicting access needs in an interpersonal interaction? Some nods. Relationships are hard. Hi, Matthew. Are you are you um are, are are you raising your hand to say yes? I have conflicting access needs in interpersonal interactions, or did you want to say something? Yes, no, no, yes, 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 du double yes, you know. <laughs> yes, Con conflicting access needs, but also trying to interpret those needs in a way where the other party makes sense can understand you too as well. It's just, it goes both ways. And to understand that together is one way to actually, you know, what are the ideas and thoughts of, you know, addressing those access needs. Thank you. Totally. And especially when we have not, um, we're not in a, a culture where it is, common for people to actually voice their access needs. Access needs are not implied um, because in fact, people are not mind readers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, recently, I was talking with some folks um, about friendships and how hard it is to make friends and that they're constantly worried about the way their friends are going to respond to them and like worried that they're not going to um, be able to um, like, you know, that they're gonna be judged and that it's like, it's pretty stressful. Um, so I'm wondering, I, I, I'm wondering how that, how that resonates with, with others about worrying about, about the judgment in social interactions. For me in the family, the way that I return to regulation, the way that I can bring my nervous system back into 
reading other people's attunement, reading other people's nervous system instead of being overwhelmed by my own, whatever it is <laughs> going on. The way that the best way for me to do that is to get down on the ground. Again, this is me, and this is experiments of years of knowing how to attune. For me, it's 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 squatting down close. It's putting both my hands on the ground for a second, the floor. So I'm I squat and I'm low. There's something about the proprioceptive work, like I think because my glutes kick in so much, I'm like, oh, here's my body, and because I get into flexion, I'm like, oh, here I am. This is my contained little nervous system. Putting my hands on the ground feels strong. I feel like, yep, I'm, I am strong. I am a strong person. I can do this. So I'm building from the sensory system back into regulation. And I've practiced it enough over the years that I can do it fairly quickly in my nervous system. Those cues kick in safety for my, for my neuroception. And it's subconscious. It's, it is something our, our brains are always doing all the time scanning the environment, scanning the interrelationships, scanning the internal relationship, the internal environment for safety. Um, and we are geared for it. So once we feel it, once we find it, it's, it's what our system wants to go to. That homeostasis is where we want to be cellularly, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so for my nervous system, it's that it's getting low, it's getting grounded. It's softening my face, like actively saying, let your eyes soften. Um, don't create some expected emotion. So that like, that shame fear response might, might create this expected like, oh, I'm okay. Right? Like, everything's fine. <laughs> Can you tell this isn't really a smile? <laughs> like, but it, it's what we do because it's what we've been socialized to do. So actively neutralizing, softening my face. And then like something about the environment for me usually helps find the horizon, look at a tree root, some sort of cue to me that's like, there's no saber toothed tiger here. There's no gaping hole that's going to suck you into the hot molten lava of the middle of the earth. This is solid ground. So you're describing that you begin with a bottom up strategy. You get into your body and you ground yourself, whatever that means to you, you ground yourself. And then you have access to your cortex where you are cortically mediating your limbic response um, because now you have access to your cortex because you did that initial bottom up yep. softening to take the edge off to like bring your cortex back online and then you yep. go to that i think a lot of people skip right to that or they try to skip right to that and they don't have access to their cortex and they you you, you can't skip it you have to do something to access your cortex yep. and there's an element of um like when you're in the thick of it even if you're like already screaming and like actively flipping your lid um, oh, yeah. you you don't have access to the impulse control to stop you don't you you may not even be able to like metacognitive metacognitively um like zoom out and watch yourself you just don't have access to that so it's really just like it's happening get to the ground if that's how you ground um like yep. something in your body yep yeah yeah and it's ex it's it's experimental for a while it's trial and error to figure out wh what your f physical somatosensory system responds to and then once that is kind of once that's a cue of safety for your physical sensory being it grows it gets stronger um and sometimes maybe it needs tweaking like you know when my knees can't squat anymore and hopefully not for another 20 years i'll have to figure something else out <laughs> right right the other thing is that um if if someone knows that they are 
their go-to self-reg plan is a top-down, trying to use their core yep. text. Yep. One thing that I've found helpful is to prepare ahead of time what I'm wanting my cortex to do. Yep. Because if I can like uh, ideate and motor plan it ahead yep. of time, I can maybe access it as like automatic, like an automatic loop I can pull in as opposed yep. to trying to use it in the in the moment. Because then it becomes not an a stop, you know, impulse yep. control stop. It's like don't like like foot's on the gas already. Don't try to step on the brake of stop screaming at your kid. Um, it's I'm gonna go to my automatic loop. And yep. so for me, that is like the the like I said before, the the mantra of like the relationship, the relationship, yep. the relationship is primary. Like whatever that like 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 a thought I can try, even if I don't have full access to my cortex, that I can I can try that. I mean, it doesn't work maybe, but like it might no. work a lot better than like I'm going to talk myself out of how this is not, this is okay. Right. Well, I mean, and this is also gets to some of the cores of like, there's the unnumberable amounts of different brains. You think when we've talked about this, you think in specific word patterns, always your directions are in go left at and to stop lights then. To, to, so your brain does everything in that language sp space. And I do not. <laughs> I do pictures, and I I I know which rock is at the driveway that I want to drive into, not where it is on the street in words ways. So I think that's also just a self awareness piece of what works for your brain, and language works for yours. I feel so seen right now. <laughs> I mean, I, the, the language doesn't work great in my brain. So to start to do like an internal talk in the midst of feeling really dysregulated is just like, oh, that's really, that would be too much work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so it begins with self-awareness of like what, what actually calms you right. and maybe even developing an awareness of like your go-to patterns of how you negotiate life even when you're like generally regulated enough yeah yeah no absolutely which then i mean gives you that base of being able to have the space for your family to feel safe and heard and seen um because the, i mean the 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 goal is acceptance and connection for all of us. And that requires me also having that grace and acceptance of like, uh, yeah, I understand myself sometimes. <laughs> so Luna and I have been discussing power lately because mm -hmm. like, she's five and she, what's modeled for her like in video games or cartoons is like, power over people mm -hmm. and like power over people feels gross to me as a pda or like i don't want people i don't want power over me and i don't want to have power over people because it's gross so like yeah. we watch a lot of my little pony where like the messages are that the people seeking power over they never prosper it's the power of friendship, the power of connection, the power of co-regulation, which is like, you know, like, um, like a reciprocal power. Like, it's just, anyway, so like we've been talking about like, just like the different kinds of power and where do we get power? Because I feel like the like transformation from like, you know, like the traumatic transformation toward narcissism. Cause like, yeah. I mean, you can start off as, you know, like, you know, for, for, you're like a little kid and everyone has power over you and you like seek out to have power over like you don't have power you seek your power you want to claim your power and like if you only know about power over you go down that train right and like if you don't have connection like ah anyway like what do you think about this as a concept <laughs> Yeah, I think it really aligns too with the role of punishment in relationships and how power over that 
the main leverage that you get if you have power over somebody is both controlling them and punishing them. And I think that like uh, manipulating their behavior towards your good, and if they aren't aligned with that, then they deserve to be hurt for their transgression. And, you know, that's our world. Like we, we let, literally live in systems built on that. Yes. And for our kids, they're, they're trying to make sense of what happens when something is transgressed. Like, what do we, what do we do when a line is broken or, um, like within the trust, like trust gets broken or connection gets severed and we make mistakes basically. And so in a power over relationship, what happens around mistakes while well, mistakes are punished and in a power with, or a power, like in a co-regulation relationship where I mean, power doesn't even, the power is in the connection. Right. Totally. And because and I feel like, I'm like, I'm even hearing language from my five-year-old, like, like a thing that comes out a lot when like I make a mistake and then she'll say something like, you know, so like she might like, you know, and she'll be like, that's what you get for X. And I'm like, where, where did you get? That? I like, like, I mean, there's like a lot of things she says and I'm like, damn it, that came from me. Duh. But like, I don't say that. That one doesn't come out. Maybe I think it, or like, maybe yeah. I, I don't know. I don't even know. Like, is it TV? Is it, I have no idea. I have no idea. What, like my husband or the, like, I have no idea. Like if somebody actually says that, but like, I think mm -hmm. that it's just the narrative constructed from observations of the world. That's what you get for X as opposed to like, you know, like, um, uh, we have a, 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 a pediatric occupational therapist on our board who I like would love for you to meet, um, Hannah Bloom, who um, she talks a lot about the, the the cycle of repair and like, you know, so like, you know, we're all going to transgress, we're all going to make mistakes, but like it's the repair that closes that loop and, you know, like most of us grew up in a world where there was no repair, you know, just like, you know, punish, punish, punish you know, flip your lid, which is, you know, normal to flip your lid, but like, you know, no repair. Yeah, absolutely. And the repair with yourself is what I see, especially for my kids that they're externalizing, like that's what you get for is what they say to themselves too. Like when they make a mistake, then they're saying, well, of course your grown up is going to ignore you or yell at you because that's what you get. You, you messed up. And this sense that they deserve punishment is really hard to repair because our world is reinforcing that. And so it's kind of like, that's the cosmic repair work is repairing that relationship with yourself, where you have the capacity to say, I'm a person who makes mistakes. And I'm also a person who knows how to make things right. That's our family language is we all make mistakes, but we know how to make it right. And that helps us to keep coming back to repair rather than choosing what's kind of an easier path, like right. punishment right. and isolation is it's the dominant narrative to step outside of that is what's hard. Because like, <laughs> I think a lot of people who have grown up in a paradigm of like, you do the thing when the people with power over tell you to do the thing. And like, when, when like zoomed out to be like, do you see how that's setting people up for like bad, dangerous things? And they're like, oh, oh, no, I never thought about that. Now I thought about that. I'm like, ah! Oh. Um, you know, if you're designing a playground, not everybody, you know, needs to go follow the same path, right, to get to the top of the hill, but everybody has to have a path to get to the top of the hill when you're when you're designing those things. And that, that kind of visual, because it's such a good visual in my mind, for, for me at least, and it was really helpful in thinking about everything, you know, you, you, that principle of universal accessibility, if I design this meeting, uh, workplace, playground so that everybody can access it in some way they don't have to be able to do every you know you don't not have a ladder to get to the thing because you know some people can't use ladders um you know you just being able to design so everybody had access um and and a, 
and equitable access, right? And, and kind of removing the barriers, the visuals we all use. Um, and it, as part of that, I think neurodiversity was a real big feature to that. Um, thinking about um, how somebody, um, whether they be, uh, you know, autistic or Asperger's or, or just have sense of light sensitivities or hearing sensitivities or crowd um, sensitivities, how you can create spaces and places and programs and, and meetings that allow for that variety um, or how you create a workplace that accommodates the variety. Uh, and at United Way, we've really, we've tried to, to think about what we're doing externally, but also thinking about the people who do the work here and supporting them in that journey. Oh, that's so beautiful. And I think that, you know, um, sometimes people, when they have that visual of physical access, um, you know, as it relates to mobility related disability, visible disabilities, um, that maybe is for some people how they can begin to think about this lens. And then they can maybe take the next step to say, well, um, invisible disabilities, it's um, uh, just as important to think about how everyone has to get to the top of the hill um, and to have multiple paths to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people who struggle in their workplaces, they don't know that they have an invisible disability. So they don't have language to talk about it because they don't know that's what's the barrier between them and the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. They may just know that they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And I think that when an organization is large enough to have like a human resources division, um, if the top down lens isn't, you know, oh, this person has this disability, um, and um, they need accommodations for like, if the kind of the, 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 that flag is not checked, it may not come into the conversation. It might be, you know, some organizations talk about, you know, we have disciplinary problems, we have difficult employees, or like when I was, when I was chief resident during my training, we had, you know, difficult learners, like but really this was neurodivergent with barriers to access. And this is how this played out. So it's like a total lens shift. Um, when, when we think about some explanations for why people are struggling, why people are dysregulated, why people are, you know, uh, the conflicting access needs, they are about access needs. Mm -hmm. I, I think it really relates, Mel, what I've, from my experience as a leader too, what I've seen is that it's it's directly rele relevant to our, the way we treat uh, physical health care and mental health care, right? So if you think about physical health care where you, we have access to that, right? We, it, look, health insurance, it's not affordable, <laughs> but it's, but there's, there's, it's accepted. Um, and it's also not seen as a choice thing right if you get uh, those type of physical ailments it's not seen as you chose to x y and z right and uh, it, what we're struggling with as a community around mental health and we don't we don't give that the same time right so you you take a sick day because you are physically sick or you take a sick day because you broke your leg everybody's like Right on, good for you. Yeah, rest up, heal up. If you are brave enough to say, I need a mental health day, right? I need, a, I need my brain needs a break. And that could be whether you have a disability or not. Um, we don't accept that. Like it's, you know, toughen up, right? That's that's the American like ideal, right? Is that you, you, you brain wise be pushed through. Um, and because we start with that, so if you start there, uh, and that's for everybody with privilege and able-bodied, and and then you try and add in a disability to that, well, now you're not only going up against accessibility issues, you're going up against cultural norms that are 
just incredibly difficult to overcome. And the disruption to the work environment and the way in which we expect people to show up nine to five, Monday through Friday, has changed fundamentally. Um, and organizations that have not necessarily adopted, that can and have not adopted the flexibility are the ones, that in many cases, everybody's struggling for workforce, but you're compounding that issue by, you know, by not accepting and talking about that. And so, but, you know, you, you named the thing, which is that in 2022, so many organizations are struggling to fill their open positions and they're struggling to retain their existing workforce. And, you know, I, I see that and I'm like, yeah, it's because you're not talking about neurodiversity and access. You could do like, but, 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 um, do you have thoughts about how that's connected um, from a CEO perspective? For sure. I think that the, you know, workforce challenges, some, many of them are rooted in, we still have old structures in terms of our work expectations as a, as a society, right? Um, and it's a, um, and not that every other, other countries have this perfect and right, and many are way worse than we are in terms of uh, accommodating. Uh, some do it better, and it's, some of that is cultural. Um, and, um, you know, examining if, if we had the space and time and capacity to examine what are the systemic barriers that are keeping people from being part of the workforce, because we all need to work. I mean, not the kids, they got to go to school and you got to, uh, but we all, you know, we do, it's part of society. It's not just a means to an end for myself. It's not just how I pay my rent or mortgage or I feed my family. It's how everybody does it. And that's, that's kind of where the whole thing's based on that. Um, and we don't all have the privilege of getting a tremendous amount of value from what we do, like you and I do, right? Of like, you know, we, there are, you know, we need people to do the X thing. Um, and there's a need for that. And it's not always, uh, altruistic or rewarding in the same way. Um, but if we think about how do we make it so that people want to work, <laughs> um, in our environments, whether it's making a thing, right. Or it's, it's community building or it's healthcare, you know, um, and when I say healthcare, I mean all of healthcare, mental health care, physical health care. Um, it's, it, we could, you know, you could probably think about how we're addressing a lot of those things. And there are so many barriers that keep people in the way of being employed. It's one of the things Working Bridges works a lot on with the social determinants that get in the way. So you've got childcare, housing, you know, uh, transportation, uh, food insecurity, all of these things and wages, of course, stacked on top of that, you then start getting into the issues of, well, what's the barrier in terms of my the work environment and, and what is expected of me in terms of how I'm showing up uh, to do X thing that you've hired me to do. Um, and so I think it plays a huge role in, um, you know, those, those intersectionality of all of those things. Are, are oftentimes what keep people from, from being part of the workforce. Being so much of what you've said um, is about the way you see the world. And that's what sets the tone of leadership is that you actually believe um, that we all do things differently and that you can shift the environment around so that the people who work for you thrive. If you don't have that lens, nothing you're gonna do is gonna feel real to your people. But if you start with, we are all human, and, you know, it's, my colleagues talk a lot about human-centered design in terms of meetings and spaces and doing those things, you get a lot farther. I think you can have a lot, a lot more space. And, um, you know, maybe culturally, one of the big things that we miss and we lack in today's day and age is the ability to have a conversation with each other and be a little bit vulnerable on both ends of, I don't know what I don't know. All right, perfect. Um, I actually, um, I, I, I want to uh, respond to a comment Sarah just threw out in the chat um, around um, cultural norms. I mean, that not that essentially what we've been talking about all year with brain rules um, and, and essentially redefining uh, culture? I mean, what is, what is culture if not the attitudes and practices of a group of people? 
and we're a group of people. So I think it's got to start somewhere. I'm just reading uh, Matt's comment in the chat. The idea of cultural norms as the barrier, so pervasive. This is the way we've always done things. Yeah, right. Um, but the real problem is the lack of awareness around the fact that the idea of, quote, this is the way we've always done it is actually the problem and not the individual seeking equity. Yeah, I see. I see. I see. I, I see this is resonating with a lot of folks here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And, you know, um, I, I can say, you know, uh, personally, my own my own journey in unlearning these principles is very much supported by 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 this community, right? Like it 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 starts with an idea, and you connect or about the idea with another person, and then it's more people, and it's I think that's what you know. Uh, it's like Kelly shared about a uh, holiday weekend when Kelly, when you were able to discern between like, I'm home and my access needs are met versus now I'm in a situation where I'm overstimulated. Like maybe, maybe six months ago, you wouldn't have been able to do that. Like the more you spend time around people and environments where you actually feel like it works that the culture, including attitudes, practices, vibe, energy, cultural norms, um, is working for you and meeting your needs. That is what allows you to discern when your needs are not being met. I wonder what people think about that concept. I think that's so true. And I think it just takes so much practice, you know, to kind of get to know and, and notice those signs in yourself about like when something feels good or doesn't feel good. And the more that you practice it, I find that I'm getting better at noticing that and you know, being able to tweak things accordingly. Kelly. Hello. Um, I just completely forgot what the heck I was gonna say because I was so focused on remembering to lower my hand. Um, oh, that's what it is. Is it, for me, it wasn't so much of like, recognizing like whoa this situation is not working it it was the the inability to ignore the cultural expectations the expectations put on me by whatever people i'm around or the setting that i'm in you know if you're at work you can't flip your lid at work because you're at work and you have responsibilities and you can't flip your hit, hit, you know, lid at home when you're a mom because, oh my gosh, the kids are just gonna think that you're out of control and then they're not gonna listen. And absolute brain rolls, 100%. And so now I'm more able to not only like notice the discomfort in myself, but speak up for it. And, and that's the part that I think is, is the hardest for me because, you know, somebody mentioned, you know, not wanting to be perceived as high maintenance or needy. And that is exactly how I feel like, like, oh my gosh, I don't want people to think that, you know, everybody's got to speak at a volume too. Like it's not all the time. It's just walking into a house of people at a volume 12 is, is a lot, you know, and I wasn't able to say it then, but you know, my husband read like, okay, she hasn't taken off her coat. She is sitting on the floor. Like it's time, it's time to go home, you know? And I'm grateful for that. And I think that's my tricky part is now being able to give myself the permission to speak up for myself the way that I speak up for my child when I notice that he's dysregulated. Like I, nothing will stop me from speaking up for him, <laughs> but everything stops me from speaking up for myself. Right, and I think it's just practice. I mean, uh, I had a conversation with someone earlier today, like, isn't this like the ultimate experiment? Like experimenting with shifting cultural norms. And um, if it feels safe to advocate for someone else, um, and, uh, then you, then you do that and you practice that and that's how you practice that skill. And then in environments where 
it feels safe to advocate for one of your own needs um, and, and in a way that, you know, isn't directly challenging someone else's brain rules. Maybe, maybe that's what you try on first. And then I think it just grows. It's, all, think, it's all practice. Sorry, Matt, go ahead. Oh, no worries. Um, no. And, and speaking of practice, you know, with, with almost every client I work with, and I never really read this in a book in graduate school or anything else. It's sort of something that I've just developed on the fly as I've worked with people. Um, most people, our work comes down to one thing, and, and that is answering the question, what is my relationship to my experience? And, and when you can get in there <laughs> and mess around and really pull apart, you know, what is others? <laughs> what is you? What is your reaction to others? What is others' reaction to you? Um, what, you know, how, it's not what we go through very often. It's how we go through what we go through. So, so, and, and it's, and at first, I think people are, um, are taken aback. But really what I've found is it, is it is absolutely the route to empowerment. Because we are all we can control and we can't control all of us all the time, all of ourselves all the time. But what we can do, you know, we should focus on doing and that way we find our strength and, and, and the ability to inhabit and engage in our experience. That was so beautifully said, um, so much more elegantly than I could have. Um, and I think you're you're exactly right. And I think it's about um, like like the, there's there's part of the brain rules are what is it that I need to feel good mm -hmm. and 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 being curious about that too, mm -hmm. because it, it may not be what you thought. Maybe it's that what you were, uh, what many people are seeking is around, around what you just said is having, having a, a, a shift in one's relationship to their own experience. Um, because, maybe something that's more authentic. Yeah, because very often in childhood, what we learn when we don't have the perspective and the experience, um, um, adaptation in childhood and uh, helps get us through things that we struggle with. And, and the child's brain is a, is a brilliant tool in doing that. But very often those adaptations become maladaptive in adulthood and need to be revisited and, and, reworked um and so and so um yeah what what works for us in in childhood um can sometimes become kind of those urges that we experience in adulthood and uh, another thing i talk to clients about is a lot of times when you're feeling an urge to do something um yep think about something else <laughs> yeah and I think um, this this leads really well into the topic of our uh, our New Year's Eve Brain Club. Um, and since since I already know how the uh, since we pre-recorded the first half of it, um, uh, you know, I, this topic comes up, um, mm -hmm. which is it's you know all of the brain rules around like reinventing oneself every New Year of like I'm going to be the best version of myself, a better version of myself. Like how about I'm actually going to be an authentic version of myself mm -hmm. um, or, or, or I'm, 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 you know, thinking about Kelly's example of self-advocacy. Um, maybe it's not about, I need to grow this new skill, but maybe I connect with an interdependent group of people that, to, to help address access needs. Like maybe even the brain rules of self-advocacy. Um, like maybe there are other ways of, 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 of achieving access, where actually the last time Amanda Beekman presented at Brain Club, we talked about, um, is it possible to meet your access needs without imposing 
new demands on other people. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, and so anyway, it's just there's there's I, I think there's so many different things to try on and see what fits. Hmm. I don't think there's one right way. But inter- interdependence is so key. It's 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 a natural part of being human and it's something that's so demonized. Um, on Christmas Eve, my tooth hurt and I my dentist is in Williston and I emailed him and he and he um, without a second thought, he I drove up there, he left his house and his family. He turned on all the lights and the machines and we figured out what was wrong with my tooth. And like, and I texted him afterward and I I talked to him about the value of that in my life, because I don't know where I'd be today in terms of my pain level or my ability to tolerate if he hadn't just done that. And he said, well, that's what I'm here for. I'm sorry you had to go through all of that. And I think that's a beautiful story of, of, of it being okay to be connected to other humans. And to ask for help. Right. Right. So, and, and, and I, I forget who said it in the chat earlier um, about this, like it's the messages of childhood that interfere so much. I mean, that's where a lot of brain rules come from, right? Is like, mm-hmm. you're told, you know, like be independent, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps or like, you know, like all the things, all the things that are so unhelpful and like uh, harmful. And, mm-hmm. and I, 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 I think this is yet another one of those examples. Um, but we uh, we unlearn we unlearn together. So much more valuable in my life uh, in the past ten years than what I've learned, and I've learned a lot of valuable things. Is is the things that I've unlearned? Totally. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to post. Um, the New Year's thing one more time to support anyone's executive functioning who would benefit. It's your registration link for virtual New Year's. Um, and in a couple of days, we'll send out the actual schedule with Zoom links and all that stuff. But we, we, we hope to see, see you there. And uh, we'll also be sending out, hold on, Lizzie, do you have the the registration link for January Brain Club. I wanted to post that before we wrapped up. Are you posting it or you want me to go find it? I think I have it now. I'll put it in. Oh, sweet. That's awesome. Oh, I got it. Amazing. It was in my email. All right, cool. Yep. Uh, all right, perfect. great. Oh, thank you, Lizzie. Perfect. So that is uh, the sign up link. It's free registration for January Brain Club. Uh, Life reimagined is our theme. So it's 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 all variations and all the things we keep talking about. Just at a, uh, a, a on a, a new level, we continue to to build on. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Happy New Year, everybody.